major part of hospital medicine involves trying to maintain homeostasis, keeping the patient's body working normally. To do so, the patient requires a certain amount of food, water and electrolytes each day. As a practitioner, you're required to assess the electrolyte balance. In this tutorial, I'm going to look at water and electrolyte distribution through the body, particularly the difference between intracellular and extracellular fluid. I will introduce the concept of how intravenous fluids actually damage the interstitial space. We will then look at the daily electrolyte requirements and why, when prescribing intravenous fluids, it's imperative not to forget the intracellular space. Tutorial 5 Electrolyte Distribution Previously, we discussed osmolarity and osmolality, the calculation of osmolarity and the osmol gap, the tonicity of intravenous fluids, isotonic, hypotonic and hypertonic, and a little known thing known as the osmotic coefficient. This time I will discuss why most body fluids are not really liquid. Daily fluid and electrolyte requirements and how to prescribe appropriate maintenance fluids. Let's start with a scenario. You're in the ICU and there you encounter Sam who is 62 years old and he was admitted with septic shock. He subsequently developed oliguric acute kidney injury and over the first 24 hours that he had been in the ICU he had been administered 10 litres of intravenous fluid. Now, nine days following admission, he's severely edematous. He has bubbles under his skin that rupture and leak yellow fluid into the bed. What's going on here? Let's start with some science. Pretty much everybody knows that the human body is made up 60% or so of water, 55% for females. But in fact, very little of this is liquid. Just remember this picture of gelatin or jello or jelly. This is very much what the liquid in your body is made up of. Now, inside this water are dissolved a variety of different organic and mineral salts, but the superstructure is built on a skeleton. It's a scaffold, and that's made of mineral salts. And then you've all these different tissues that are made up of protein and fat. Wrapped around all of this is a parcel of gelatin. And the best way to think of gelatin is that it is structured fluid. When we think about water distribution in the body, two thirds of body water is intracellular and one third is extracellular. And of that extracellular fluid, two thirds is in the interstitial space and one third is in the intravascular space. So to draw this all up together, we have a big, large intracellular space, an interstitial space, and then an intravascular space. That's made up of arteries, veins, where most of the fluid is, and lymphatics. And here's the thing. It is only in that intravascular space that body fluids are liquid. Outside the intravascular space, we have this interstitial space, and that space is made up of an extracellular matrix. It's gelatinous, it's structured, and it contains collagen, elastin, glycosaminoglycans, proteoglycans, and there are a whole bunch of different cells, um, such as macrophages, fibroblasts, and leukocytes, etc. Now, there are water molecules in there, but they bounce around the matrix. There is no fluid flow just little droplets that pop around. Now this is a different cartoon of that extracellular space. So just think about this textured space here being your nicely um, structured gelatin. And then what we're gonna do here is we're gonna give this patient a whole bunch of IV fluid like Sam got in his first day. So with aggressive fluid resuscitation, a lot of that fluid extravasates into the extracellular matrix and starts to hydraulically fracture that, to frack that extracellular matrix. And then the, the matrix is damaged. And then with further fluid resuscitation, pockets of fluid collect in that extracellular matrix. And when they coalesce, edema forms. And the tissue from being nice and springy 
uh, and and um, and kind of pushes back at you suddenly becomes boggy and what you put your finger in a divot stays there in the tissue and we call that pitting edema so we, <laughs> what has happened to sam here is that sam has developed a huge amount of volume overload so that his extravascular space has become very very edematous and full of liquid and what happens when that starts to break through the skin is that he starts to leak extracellular liquid which is full of albumin and other proteins that's why it's yellow into the bed so that doughy edematous tissue is very prevalent here and sam now needs to be de-resuscitated of a lot of this resuscitation fluid if this cannot be achieved using diuretic agents he will need some form of hemofiltration or renal replacement therapy let's now explore what a patient might actually need if they're lying around the hospital bed for several days and we look at the daily fluid electrolyte requirements and then the concept of maintenance fluids and this will be a fairly typical example. Vincent is 80 kilograms, he's a male, and he can't swallow. You're told to put him on maintenance fluid, and the nurse hangs a bag of uh, compound sodium lactate, that might be Harpen solution or lactated ringers. Is this an appropriate choice of a fluid, and how much does he actually need? Well, normally, our fluid and electrolyte requirements are obtained by eating and drinking. Intravenous fluid is unnecessary and potentially dangerous, and we did not evolve as a species to get fluids delivered to our bodies intravenously. This is a completely abnormal thing. Fluid is supposed to be, to be absorbed into our bodies through the gastrointestinal tract, and there are all kinds of um, homeostatic systems that were built in through evolution for controlling the amount of fluid in our body and by giving fluids intravenously we are bypassing those controls so when do we need to give intravenous fluids um, well this is when patients can't drink won't drink or are not allowed to drink if the water is not available or it's not potable if the patient is unconscious if for some reason the gastrointestinal tract is off limits because the patient has a bowel obstruction then the patient won't be able to take in fluid and they'll become profoundly dehydrated and deficient in electrolytes um, and this is actually fairly common because this often uh, results from an order uh, of nil per mouth npo uh, when a patient is uh, fasting for surgery um, and sometimes that goes on a long time and uh, and it's often missed if it's going on for many 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 hours now, extracellular fluid in, the mo in most human beings is approximately 15 litres. It can vary between 10 and 20 litres, but we're going to just sit on 15 litres as the extracellular fluid volume. And it contains about 140 millimoles of sodium. Uh, and so um, if you work this out, 140 millimoles by 15 results in you finding about 2,100 millimoles of sodium in the extracellular space. It also contains 102 to 105 millimoles per liter of chloride, so over 15 liters. That works out at about 1,530 millimoles in total. So 2,000 millimoles of sodium, 1,530 millimoles of chloride. Now, if you look at your various different body compartments and the different things that are in there, first of all, I've mentioned sodium and chloride to give you an idea of how much is in there. And they're the big, big, big players in the extracellular space. The only comparably even vaguely large quantity um, electrolyte that's in the extracellular compartment is bicarbonate. And bicarbonate is a metabolic byproduct of carbon dioxide. It is not um, a salt. It comes from carbon dioxide. Um, I'm not going to talk about plasma proteins. Now let's move to the intracellular space. And in the intracellular space, you'll notice here that there isn't that much sodium and chloride. In fact, the big players here are potassium 
and there's about 150 millimoles per liter of potassium. And then, of course, phosphorus or phosphate um, as it is uh, biologically, and there's about 100 milli equivalents of phosphate. On the surface, you think, well, sodium and, and potassium chloride and phosphorus, they're about the same, but they absolutely are not because there's nearly twice as much potassium as sodium in the body because the intra cellular space is twice the size as the extracellular space. So there is a way of kind of looking at this. This is the electrolyte distribution. So on the outside, you have the major electrolytes are sodium, chloride, and bicarbonate. And on the inside are potassium, phosphorus, magnesium, and calcium. And water, of course, moves seamlessly along osmotic gradients between the two spaces. Now, in terms of your daily intake, on average, the human being needs about 30 kilocalories per kilo per day. They also need about 25 to 30 mils per kilo per day of liquid water in whatever shape or form one wants to consume it. Now, be aware that fruit and vegetables are principally made up of water, and we actually make water during metabolism. So most adults only need about 1,500 mils of pure liquid per day. So taking our patient Brian or our patient Vincent, whichever one we have, and we look at them, uh, um, um, Brian is an 80 kilogram male. He needed 2,400 uh, kilocalories of energy, and he also needed approximately... 2,400 mils of water. So ideally, if you could make a food for him that contained one calorie per mil and gave that over 24 hours um, uh, as, um, as 100 mils per hour, that would pretty much cover his liquid and his nutritional uh, requirements. And this, of course, is done with nasogastric feeds. But let's also look at his daily electrolyte requirements. And here you can see here, um, these are the electrolyte requirements um, on the left, uh, in the middle um, column here, um, per kilogram, and you need about one millimole per kilo, uh, at least anyway, of sodium, one millimole per kilo of chloride, one millimole per kilo of potassium, and 0.1 millimole per kilo of magnesium, calcium, and phosphorus, and about two to four grams in total of glucose. Now, if you scale that up to 80 kilos for our patient, Brian, we have 80 millimoles of sodium chloride and potassium, and then eight millimoles of magnesium, calcium, and phosphorus. So, you know, these are the big players here. So when you're looking at all of this, you go, oh, okay, fine, I get that. That's, a, that's what he needs. But of course, nobody goes out and buys food in millimoles or milli equivalents, they buy stuff in grams. So the question is, how much salt does Brian need per day? At 80 kilograms, he needs approximately 80 millimoles of sodium and 80 millimoles of chloride. A gram of sodium, as you will recall, is 42.5 millimoles. So 80 millimoles is 1.88 grams. One gram of chloride is 28.5 millimoles. So 80 millimoles is 2.8 grams. As the relationship between sodium and chloride is approximately 60% chloride and 40% sodium in just table salt, then Brian needs approximately 5 grams of salt per day. Now, of course, saying that he needs that, that assumes that Brian isn't critically ill and he isn't losing mineral salts from sweat or vomit or diarrhea or bowel obstruction or drains or diuretics, or he doesn't have some strange salt losing nephropathy. So that's kind of a ballpark figure, three to five grams, about five grams, I think, for most human beings. Now, when someone says to me, well, how much salt is in five grams? Well, here is an easy way of knowing what five grams of salt is. You know these sashes because you've put these on your fries many times. That's five grams of salt, okay? About seven of these sachets. But sometimes it can be a little bit confusing. And if you go to this very well-known um, um, takeaway uh, restaurant, you'll see these sachets here. And if you actually look at the nutritional facts 
uh, badly sachets, you'll just see this one thing here. And this is the sodium content because most people don't care about chloride, right? Because even though the chloride is where all the great flavor is in salt, they just think about the sodium. And so when you see the COL, there's only, there's 270 milligrams of sodium in there, but how much salt is there? How much chloride is there? What's the salt content in grams? So let's work that problem. We know that the sodium is 270 milligrams and that this represents 40% of the amount of salt. So we call that X. So 270 times 0.4 X is um, 270 divided by 0.4, which is 675 milligrams. So the chloride is 675 minus 270, and that works out at 405 milligrams. So there's 275 of sodium, 405 of chloride, and the total amount of salt is 675 milligrams in that sachet. Now, remember Vincent a little bit a while ago? Well, Vincent was going to get a bag of compound sodium lactate, and, and uh, on, on outside of the United States, this is known as Hartman's solution. It could be lactated ringer solution. For all intents and purposes, it doesn't matter, but we are going to give him a bag of Hartman solution. And that we know that Vincent needs 2.4 liters of water per day, and that works out at, well, two and a half bags of standard IV fluid, and he also needs about five grams of salt a day. So when we look at our bottle of, um, of compound sodium lactate, one of the questions you might ask is, well, how much salt is in this bag? And you'll recall we actually uh, worked on this way back in a couple of um, tutorials ago. There is six grams of sodium chloride. There is 400 milligrams of KCL. There's 270 milligrams of calcium chloride. And there's also sodium lactate, 3.2 grams. So we can pretty much simplify this into one gram of sodium, 42. Um, we know that there is 131 uh, millimoles of sodium in this particular um, bottle, right? Because it's on it there. Uh, we don't have to do all that nerding that we did before. So there's three grams of sodium. We know that the chloride um, is 111 and one gram of chloride is 28.5 millimoles. So 111 divided by 28.5 works out at four grams of chloride. So in this bag, when you take all this KCL, NACL, sodium lactate, etc., you end up with seven grams of table salt. And one bag of this, therefore, is giving Vincent more than his entire sodium and chloride requirement for the day. And, it, and it's not just a sodium lactate solution. In fact, isotonic saline solution has even more sodium and chloride in it. There is nine grams in that bag and plasmalite 148, an isotonic fluid, actually contains about eight grams and that takes a bit of figuring out as well. And it's really important to understand that these fluids are made to look like extracellular fluid and to replace extracellular fluid whether the patient's vomiting or bleeding or has diarrhea they are resuscitation fluids they are not maintenance fluids and the problem is that if you keep on running isotonic salt solutions for days and days and days the patient starts to get really puffy and then they get edematous and they're essentially function like a big lump of ham just cured meat that's just full of salt and this is devastatingly um, bad for the body. The patient is fluid overloaded and salt overloaded and the tissues get really boggy. So what should we be giving Vincent? Well, he needs 2.4 liters of water per day. That's very, very easy. That's 100 mils an hour. And of course, he needs the sodium chloride, about 80 millimoles. Uh, so, you know, figuring this out, ideally, he would get a bag um, he gets per hour 100 mils of water, 4 millimoles of sodium, 4 millimoles of chloride, um, 4 millimoles of potassium, and about a tenth of that of magnesium and calcium. Or um, ideally, if there was a bag um, that contained this perfect stuff, you'd have 40 millimoles of sodium, 40 millimoles of potassium, 40 millimoles of chloride, and a bit of magnesium. Possibly not the calcium because of the problem of blood clotting in the, um, in the tubing that I'll get back to at a later stage. So if we were going to construct this perfect IV fluid, we'd have 40 of sodium chloride, 40 of potassium. 
Then we'd have about four of magnesium. We'd buffer this all with lactate, acetate, or gluconate, and then about 60 grams of glucose. So that will be our ideal maintenance fluid. Unfortunately, what most people use is this particular fluid. This is 5% dextrose with half strength saline. Half saline dextrose, half dextrose. You hear all kinds of ways of describing this, but it's half saline with dextrose. It's isotonic, incidentally, because of the dextrose. It's not a hypotonic fluid. It functions as a hypotonic fluid, but it is isotonic. So there's 5% dextrose in there, which is 5 grams per 100 mils or 50 grams per liter. So in a bag, a liter, there are 200 kilocalories. And what you have here with half strength saline, you have 77 millimoles of sodium, 77 millimoles of chloride, pretty much what um, Vincent needs today. Uh, but unfortunately, there is no potassium, magnesium, calcium, or phosphorus. What physicians and nurses usually do to re, um, balance this, of course, is they add in uh, KCL. So the, the, the half strength saline with dextrose usually contains 40 millimoles of KCL. So we have the same amount of dextrose here, and we have our half uh, strength saline, which is 77 of sodium and 77 of chloride. But we also have 40 millimoles of potassium chloride, which is great 40 millimoles of potassium. But we now have another 40 millimoles of chloride. So now we're up to 107 millimoles of chloride, remembering that we only needed 80. So, you know, Brian will receive three times his daily um, base uh, chloride requirements with this fluid um, 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 and, and nearly all his salt requirements are in this one bag. Um, so, you know, even if you take a, a um, you know, a liberal view of chloride at, at 80 millimoles, it's still a lot more chloride than this patient needs. And remember, it's going to get up to more than 300 millimoles in a day if he's getting three liters of this stuff. Um, so just a suggestion, rather than always adding uh, KCL to these fluids, you could consider using potassium phosphorus. Now, there is um, a, 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 a fluid that is available um, uh, commercially, and this is the first of these modern um, maintenance fluids that have been constructed. This one is known as Mantelite. I am not being paid to show you this. Um, it's essentially a kind of a hypotonic version of Plasmalite. And this particular fluid contains 40 millimoles of sodium, 40 millimoles of chloride, 20 millimoles of potassium, a little bit of magnesium, 1.5 millimoles, 23 millimoles of acetate and about 50 grams of glucose. So it pretty, pretty much quite close to that ideal fluid that I showed you earlier on. So if you look at, um, for example, um, giving 100 mils an hour to Brian, who's getting two and a half liters essentially a day, um, with the half saline and um, KCL, he's, he was gonna get about 185 millimoles of uh, of sodium uh, with the uh, with the chloride the same but of course that goes up to 256 when you add in the uh, KCL and then the potassium would work out at about 96 all very respectable but a little bit more than he needs glucose 120 with mentolite he would receive 96 of sodium 96 of chloride 48 of potassium a little bit lower than he might need and 3.6 um, of um, magnesium, you know, uh, not quite what he needs. He'd need about eight millimoles, but still pretty good. So, you know, Mentolite will give him what he needs, uh, not exactly what he needs, um, 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 half uh, uh, saline with uh, dextrose and um, KCL will give him a little bit too much chloride. Now, there are all kinds of other ways of doing this. You could use compound sodium lactate, a liter plus 1400 mils, of dextrose 5% with KCL. In that case, um, two and a half liters of that or 2,400 mils of that will give him 131 of sodium, 167 of chloride, 61 of potassium, and a little bit of calcium. There is no magnesium in compound sodium lactate solutions, whether it is Hartmann's in this case, or lactated ringers in this case. And honestly, there isn't a huge amount of electrolyte differences between the two. Let's review this tutorial. In this tutorial, we covered fluid and electrolyte distribution in the body. 
fluid and calorie requirements per day, isotonic resuscitation versus hypotonic maintenance fluid, and finally, as part of that, the risk of chloride overload despite using hypotonic fluids. Now, this completes module one of this um, part of the fluids tutorial series. Next time, we're going to move on to module two. In the next tutorial, I will discuss the stress response, perioperative fluid distribution, and perioperative fluid planning. Okay, so that was fluid and electrolyte distribution in the body, why we must take care of both the extracellular and intracellular spaces, and how to prescribe maintenance fluids. Congratulations, you've now finished module one of this course, The Basics. Next time we'll move on to module two and start with the essential concept of the stress response.